Hey, what's up? It's Josh Rosenthal. This is my new book. It's called The Record Store of the Mind. And I'm here to read part of it for you today. And I will begin. I was shopping recently at On The Corner Records in Campbell, California with my older daughter, Emma. On The Corner is my favorite record store in the Bay Area, though I'm a bit hesitant to say so because I don't want you to go there. Naturally, I want first dibs on all the $6 Yazoo records, the condition challenged $1 sold LPs and boxes on the floor, the below market value yet pricier gems in the new arrivals box on the counter, and the impeccable rockabilly section. While perusing the stacks, Emma asked, how do you know what you're looking for? Normally I'd muster some mildly irritated dad grunt as acknowledgement that I'd heard her voice as she's so accustomed to him, especially in record stores. She sensed from a young age that record shopping was very important to me, and I dragged her in her stroller to the flea market on 11th Street and Avenue A in sub-freezing temperatures in search of cheap, distressed blue notes and prestiges. I also subjected her to the noise, stench, and all-around depravity of the annual WFMU record fair. She knows that look in my eyes that says, we're not going home anytime soon. I lifted up my head and stared at the wall. How do I know what I'm looking for? I went back to looking at records. She had asked me probing philosophical questions, one I'd never bothered to ask myself. She had interrupted my shopping. A few minutes later, Emma pulled out an LP. What about this? It was a record by Philippe Bruneau. Giving it a quick once-over, I tabulated and itemized certain attributes that made the LP promising. I'd never heard of the artist, nor seen the record. The cover showed a gray-haired guy wearing a plaid shirt, holding an accordion. The record looked to be from the early 70s, 1973 to be exact. It had the original shrink wrap on it with the original price sticker, $1.99. It also had a new price sticker on it, $1.99. Adjusted for inflation, the record really should have been $10.60. It was on a reputable label, Philo, that had an air of authenticity emanating from the liner notes and song descriptions. It had spare instrumentation, listing only accordion, bass, and piano. The LP was in perfect condition. The record was disappointing on the commercial end of the traditional French-Canadian dance music. On the commercial end of traditional French-Canadian dance music, the sort of monotonous, cloyingly whimsical stuff you hear on a carousel sands the barrel organ. The music made me think of carousels, and carousels make me think of vomit. So the record is bad, but it doesn't matter, because Emma was very, did a very surprising thing. She tapped right into my aesthetic, presenting in one 12 by 12 square many of the attributes she sensed I'd be searching for. Maybe you think it's bad parenting that I watched my kids' lips turn blue while I read the back cover liner notes of an I Quebec LP, but I beg to differ. I was demonstrating to my kids that I really cared about something. My passion was certainly way more important than where their next snack was coming from. My daughter Hazel was obsessed with Littlest Pet Shops for a couple of years. She had about a hundred of those things. It was her passion, and I wondered if she had picked up a collector gene from me. She would beg to go to Walgreens to get that special LPS she had never seen before. Her mom and I would point out to her that she'd already had a lot of these things. Did she really need another? It was the same question my, my mom asked me when I hauled my entire record collection off to college. Hell yes, I need all of these. You might say that's bad parenting too, that Hazel was spoiled. Yet I never hesitated to buy her LPSs because honestly, how much longer is she going to want those things? Besides, experts say freeform play with toys is great for developing creativity in the mind. She still likes to play with them at my house, although it hurt my heart a little when she recently told me that she never plays with them with her friends anymore because she's too old. Everything in life seems the result of randomness, chance encounters, and the unexpected. It's the quest that makes collectors crazy in the head, whether it's stamps, LPs, or LPSs. You go to the flea market because you never know what might be there, and the possibilities are infinite. As I sit here in San Francisco on this Saturday morning, I wonder what I'm missing over at Groove Yard, Groove Merchant, Grooves, Stranded, The Beat Museum, 1234Go, Bird and Beckett, Maud Lang. What about the former owner of Village Music, who sells only on Saturdays in Mill Valley? 
Amoeba times two, Aquarius, Rasputin times three, Streetlight, Recycled, Rocky, Rookie Ricardos, Alamini Flea, Alameda Flea, Dave's, Jack's, Walden, Walden Pond, Explorist International, Down Home, Red Devil, Vinyl Solution, Mill Valley Music, Green Apple Books, Book Bay in Fort Mason, where I found an original copy of the Art Farmer Quintet's When Farmer Met Grice on Prestige for $6. Maybe I should drive up to Petaluma to the Thrifty Hippie. There's even what I consider the extreme sports version of record shopping, more like an endurance test. I played at places like 101 Music in North Beach, with thousands of LPs down in the damp, damp dungeon. You literally can't walk around, and you need a hazmat suit, or at the very least, a dust mask. Think the West Coast equivalent of equally nasty The Thing in Brooklyn, or Music Inn in New York City. I'm surprised they don't make you sign something before you walk in there. These are places where you're just as like, likely to contract histoplasmosis or dang fever as you are to find some coveted private press folk record. A bit further, farther afield, there's Needle to the Groove in Fremont near Niles, best known as the site of several Charlie Chaplin movie shoots, which has the largest selection of 70s major label LPs I've never seen I've ever seen sick. There's even a not-for-profit record store in San Rafael, bedrock music and video. The place is stuck in the 90s with its plastic keepers on CDs and a VHS rental business. I recently went in there and found a Charlie Feathers LP, Mickey Newberry's His Eye on the Sparrow, and a Maddox Brothers and Rose LP, all for $9. I said, how's business? The guy said, slow to non-existent, but we're a, non we're a not for profit that's the only way we stay open. The store is run by young adults, ages 18 to 28, through a local emancipation home, Four Winds West. Oh, and there are the annual sales. The record man down in Redwood City has a parking lot sale in October. Everything is one dollar. That's where I found the mega rare Vanguard LP by 60s psychedelic band Elizabeth. I gave it to my buddy David Katz Nelson because I knew he'd appreciate it more than me or the San Francisco Public Library sale, which takes place in an airplane hangar at Fort Mason. Crabby old guys line up hours before the opening with big shopping carts and fill them up with $1 records, leaving nothing but Burl Ives LPs and flower drum song soundtracks in their wake. When I look at the map of the USA, I see record stores. I look at a state and think about the stores I visited there and how I can't wait to go back someday. Given how our world has changed since the 1970s when I was a kid, it's heartening to see so many of these points of light still beaming out across our nation. The soul and character of a city or town is reflected by the record store and or the bookstore, a central point of community for the culturally engaged. A place like Stereo Jacks in Cambridge, for example, the banter that goes down in there between the employees and customers is the musical equivalent of car talk, except much funnier. These places are oases in our increasingly alienating digital society. At various times in my life, the record store has served as an escape hatch or safe harbor, a place to cut Hebrew school or cool out a domestic conflict. But mainly it's about the quest, the bottomless pit of recorded music that awaits you in all its gloriously untidy randomness at the church sale or the garage sale, in the cardboard box next to a garbage can on Mercer Street where I found an original mint copy of Bill Evans' Waltz for Debbie, or at Valhalla's in Oak Park where Riley Walker discovered guitar maestro John Holbert's unknown 1972 LP, Opus 3. Chance visits to record stores have changed the trajectory of my work and life. Picking up a gospel compilation, Life is a Problem, led to the release of four multi-disc black gospel sets on my label. When I worked for a major label, I bought a CD by a band I'd never heard of, Lamb of God. I was intrigued by the band's name and the album cover. I brought the band to the attention of the A&R guy who signed them, and, then went on to sell, and they went on to sell millions of albums. I bought a record I'd never seen there before by Bill Wilson for a quarter and wound up reissuing it. I walked into a record store in San Diego in 2014 and walked out with the phone number of a local guy with a stash of old archival live tapes, which led to my releasing an unheard concert recording by old-time legend Roscoe Holcomb. So for me, the record store isn't just a place to idly dawdle. It's a place where magic can happen. Emma asked, how do you know what you're looking for? 
I guess I've spent my whole life figuring that out. It's great that I still can't fully answer her question. In this book, I write about some stuff I've done in and around music over the past 30 years. Records that I found or that found me, and records, people, and live music experiences that have forever changed the way I listen. I hope you'll be inspired. Thanks.